Science fiction frequently tries to imagine what life would be like on a plane as far above us as we are above savagery. Its setting is often of a kind that appears to us as technologically miraculous. It is thus a mode of romance with a strong inherent tendency to myth. In setting out on his subversive undertaking to highlight the inadequacies of science fiction literature, and especially the nature of its protagonists emerging from the Campbellian publications, Frank Herbert turned to earlier modes of science fiction literature for inspiration. In the likes of H. G. Wells, Jules Verne and Samuel Butler, he found science fiction that had all the hallmarks of proper refined literature. Frank Herbert initially did not want to write science fiction, seeing it as a genre that was viewed by the critical establishment as being in the gutter. This was a viewpoint held by a number of non-genre authors when their works were primarily associated with science fiction, most notably by the likes of Kurt Vonnegut Jr. Paradoxically, in setting out to return science fiction to a more literary mode, and in his deliberate iconoclasm towards the typical protagonists of the genre, Frank himself had a leaning towards keeping science fiction in the gutter where it belongs. In looking backwards to the fiction of the scientific romances and late Victorian utopias, Herbert was able to garner a proper set of literary sensibilities about him. In particular, his extrapolation of themes and ideas from Samuel Butler's Erewhon would provide him with a visionary background for his masterpiece Dune and its following two books. In conceiving the Dune series from the outset as a trilogy, and setting out to undermine the Superman and Ubermensch that were prolifically populating science fiction stories, the viewpoints of Victorian science fiction towards evolution would provide a range of ideas and speculations which would help him create his great protagonists, the anti-messiah Paul Moadi Betrides, and his son, Leto II, the tyrannical god-emperor. The first of the two major themes in the original Dune series is an examination of the nature of heroes and their role in society. In particular of concern to the Dune series, is specifically the hero who becomes a larger than life messianic figure and follows what Frank Herbert liked to call the Camelot pattern. In addition to this, Herbert also wanted to examine society's role in creating such an individual, and how their followers develop corresponding systems of power and control around their heroes, ultimately destroying them. Such a hero has an enormous morphological impact upon civilization and in being presented as a messiah, can permeate into various levels of such a society whether it is religiously, politically, or economically. It is through whichever platform that they use to eventually arise to power, usually politics, war, or religion, that provides us with Herbert's interest in linking this concept to that of the other major thematic presentation in the books, namely that of ecology. I will discuss the role of ecology in the Dune series in the following chapter. It is sufficient for the purposes of understanding here to say that Frank Herbert believed that the next great platform for such a catastrophic superhero or messiah to use and manipulate would be that of ecology. From the 1960s onwards, with growing concerns regarding the environment, the ecological bandwagon could become a new and obvious target for the right sort of demagogue to launch their career and garner mass public approval. To the degree where such an individual could guide society unquestioningly down a particular path that would ultimately be disastrous. The green issue as we see today is prevalent in party politics and the cult of personality in popular culture. Herbert believed that heroes were bad for society, and if this was indeed the case, then superheroes, those who the general public elevates above the status of mere mortals, can have devastating consequences. His views on this were particularly shaped by what he liked to call the Camelot pattern, and often cited the likes of Adolf Hitler, John F. Kennedy, and General George Patton as prime examples. While focusing on this Camelot pattern and how it is presented by the major protagonists in Dune via a number of different methods, especially by Paul Atreides and his son Leto II, I will also examine the development of the hero in the science fiction literature of the Golden Age and early post-war period. 
This will focus on the use of classical archetypes from mythology, epics and saga literature by Herbert, and his attempt to subvert the typical ubermensch that started to dominate the genre in the early 40s and 50s, especially in the form of what is known as the Van Vautian hero. In discussing the origins of Dune, Herbert often cites his theories of the disastrous hero with his notions of ecology based upon the article he was to write on sand dune encroachment and control in Oregon. Here he discusses the beginnings of his heroic concept for Dune. How did it begin? I conceived of a long novel, the whole trilogy as one book about the messianic convulsions that periodically overtake us. Demagogues, fanatics, con game artists, the innocent and the not so innocent bystanders, all were to have a part in the drama. This grows from my theory that superheroes are disastrous for humankind, that even if we find a real hero, whatever that may be, eventually fallible mortals take over the power structure that always comes into being around such a leader. The first concept that Herbert began to flesh out was that of the messianic impulse that periodically overtakes the masses and the danger of the hero or superhero to human society. Before going further and looking at Herbert's own attitudes towards these heroes, it would be prudent to first discuss what exactly we mean by the terms hero, superhero and messiah. The word hero comes from the original Greek heros, which traditionally meant simply a type of gentleman or nobleman, sometimes a king, and who had the right to meet and dole laws and justice. The term's meaning has changed little over the years, but the typical protagonists of Greek mythology and what we call the heroic age, often in addition to their noble status, had some extraordinary ability which made them truly stand out as an iconic individual, and sometimes as a person whose fame merited worship. As Simon Goldhill points out when examining Oedipus in Oedipus at Colonus, the association of cultural ritual in the play and its effect upon its audience is akin to religious reaffirmation of an old Greek tragic hero on a later society. Oedipus and his transformation from blind exile to superhuman hero, a figure honoured with offerings by the Athenians at Colonus, mobilises the powerful religious feelings of hero cult. The extraordinary abilities that set these heroes apart from mere mortal men are often varied, sometimes inherited through divine heritage or favour. Thus Heracles had his great strength, Achilles his skill in war, Theseus his intelligence, and Odysseus his deceptive cunning and wit. But to Cedric Whitman, this view of the hero is only part of their appeal and inspiration. It is the association that we have with such men that aspect we can recognise in ourselves that allows us to admire, worship and lay claim to such iconic individuals. The Greek heroic notion involves far more than mere exaggerated physical prowess. It involves somehow the totality of the human individual, writ large of course, but still representative of humanity in its individual consciousness. Therefore the possession of physical or mental prowess coupled with outstanding achievements and the admiration of society are implicit in our understanding of the heroic ideal. Even in the Oxford English Dictionary we have the following definition of the word hero. 1. A person, typically a man, who is admired for their courage or outstanding achievements. In mythology and folklore, a person of superhuman qualities in particular one of those whose exploits were the subject of ancient Greek legends. 2. The chief male character in a book, play or film. However, Dean M. Miller presents us with an insight into the term which has a certain resonance with Frank Herbert's concept of the hero. In discussing the perplexity at what the Greeks and Romans thought of as heroes, Miller isolates a key phrase of Joseph Fontenrose's, namely that these heroes were seen as powerful ghosts. This view of the hero, as Miller suggests, highlights two key concepts of heroic nature, namely that they are an intermediary power and have a fundamental association with death. In being an intermediary, and through their association with death, the hero stands apart from both humanity and the divine, yet at one and the same time is congruent to both worlds. 
In that sense, the hero has the ability to influence both real and imagined worlds, and after death or apotheosis, or both, can continue to exude such an influence upon human society. In keeping with Frank Herbert's concept of the dangerous hero, Miller states, the fact that the hero's intermediary power may in fact be something not to seek out or welcome, but to fear. As we shall see, both Paul Moadi Betraides and his son Leto II's intermediary powers, such as prescience and other memory, are indeed something for humanity to fear, their influences extending back into the real world from beyond the grave. This is carried on through their roles as both the semi-divine, Paul as prophet, and divinity, Leto II as a living god. Paul is a messiah and prophet to the Fremen, the one they call the Lisan al Gaib, or Mahdi. Paul's association with Western, Arabic, and esoteric religious icons is well realised in the Dune series. The mingling of religious ideals and icons is associated with the CET's merging of religions following the Butlerian Jihad. The name Paul is resonant with Christianity's apostle, St Paul of Tarsus, while he is also associated with the Jewish Messiah and the Islamic Mahdi and Lisan al Gaib. The Oxford Dictionary of Phrase and Fable provides us with a useful definition for the term Messiah. The promised deliverer of the Jewish nation prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. Jesus regarded by Christians as the Messiah of the Hebrew prophecies and the Saviour of humankind. Recorded from Old English in the form Messias, the name comes via Late Latin and Greek from Hebrew Masia, anointed. From the mid 17th century, the word has developed a transferred use to denote an expected liberator or saviour of an oppressed people, country, or cause. Paul then is seen as a saviour to the Fremen, one who will deliver them from the harshness of life upon Arrakis and who will lead them into a new age, where the world of Dune itself will be transformed from a barren desert world into an Eden like paradise. The Fremen themselves in Dune are based on a blending of cultures, specifically Sunni Islam, Sufism, the Bedouin, and also include elements of Judaism and Zen Buddhism. As a messiah, we can take this term to be from both the Hebrew sense of a prophesied and promised deliverer of a people, as well as in the more eclectic sense of a liberator or saviour of a repressed people. Similarly, there is also a useful definition for the term Mahdi in the Oxford Dictionary of Phrase and Fable. In popular Muslim belief, a spiritual and temporal leader who will rule before the end of the world and restore religion and justice. Not part of orthodox doctrine, the concept of such a figure was introduced into popular Islam through Sufi channels influenced by Christian doctrine. Notable among those claiming to be this leader was Muhammad Ahmad of Dongola in Sudan, whose revolutionary movement captured Khartoum and overthrew the Egyptian regime. As is often the case, there have been many people throughout history that have claimed to be the Mahdi, just as there have been many who have claimed to be reincarnations of Jesus Christ or Buddha. Again what is important here is the use of a term from yet another culture or religion which we see applied to Paul Atreides in Dune. This is notable as we will see when we view how Herbert approached the idea of his messianic hero, especially through the eclectic mythography and iconotropy that he studied. What is clear is that he is identifying messianic tropes or mythemes from various cultures to add to the mystique of the Kwisatz Satarach his particular take on the superhuman hero. The Fremen also refer to Paul as the Lisan al Gib, a phrase which Herbert translates as the voice from the outer world and giver of water. Khalid M. Bahailden, in his work on the etymology of Arabic and Islamic terms in Dune, points out that Lisan means tongue or speaker and Gaib means unknown or things that will come in the future unknown to us now. He also notes that this concept is one of the basic tenets of the Muslim faith is the belief that God alone knows what is hidden in the future. Again showing us Herbert's intent on identifying Paul Atreides with the divine or semi-divine. 
One of Paul's first acts in joining the Fremen is to kill Jamis in a ritual fight to the death. After this occurs, a transition point for the young protagonist, he is given an adopted name by the Fremen, as well as being asked to choose a troop name for himself, which only those of Siege Tabar may use. The Fremen name Paul is given at this point is Usul, which Stilgar tells him means the base of the pillar. Bahilden points out that the Arabic root Asl means base. Usul is the plural and is used for basis, principles, methods. The troop name Paul chooses for himself is Muadib, after the small kangaroo mouse of Arrakis that is admired for its ability as a good survivor in the desert. In Dune, Muad'Dib the kangaroo mouse is associated with Fremen Earth spirit mythology with a design visible on the planet's second moon. Stilgar informs Paul that the Fremen call this little creature Instructor of Boys. Again, Bahilden points out that there is an almost exact word in Arabic like it, Muadi, which means private tutor or teacher. Another appellation for Paul in June is the Kwisatz Sadarach, which roughly translated means shortening of the way, and is also suggestive of the term the one who can be many places at once. Kwisatz Sadarach is probably best compared with the English phrase shortcut, although this would really be a misnomer. In fact it is virtually identical to the term bilocation and its association with various Christian saints and holy men. Examples of bilocation occur with such notable religious personalities as Saint Pio of Pietrelchina and Maria de Jesus de Agreda. Kwisatz Haderach is a derivative from the original Hebrew Kefitzatz Haaretz, which means those for whom the earth jumped. Where this occurs in the Torah, it is descriptive of a form of miracle where an individual who is needed far away finds himself suddenly teleported to the specific location in question. Herbert's use of the term probably came from a Hasidic phrase adapted from the Kefitzat Ha'aretz, namely the Kefitzat Ha'derek. Variations include Kefitzat Ha'derek and Kefitzat Ha'derek. This was essentially an ideological explanation for how a Balai Shem, a type of mystic in certain stories, was able to travel great distances very quickly, akin almost to the power of teleportation. Paul as the hero has a degree of mystique built up around him as he has several names with different meanings and religious connotations attached to them. All of these names carry cultural and religious contexts and meanings to the discerning reader that represent a combining of humanity's dominant religious belief systems. Religious association then is widespread and multicultural with Paul Atreides as a character, and is also important within the Dune series as well, especially with regard to the Imperium's hybrid orange Catholic Bible and the Fremen's Zen Sunni faith. As Thomas Carlyle points out in his study of the hero as divinity, it is well said, in every sense, that a man's religion is the chief fact with regard to him, and that, of a man or of a nation we inquire, therefore, first of all, what religion they had. To that end the second appendix of Dune is entitled The Religion of Dune, and explains much of the faiths and belief systems developed after the Butlerian Jihad, and therefore the religious and cultural factors which allow Paul to become a prophet of the Fremen. Kwisatz Haderach is the term that Frank Herbert applies to his concept of a superhuman, an evolutionary shortcut created by the Bene Gesserit breeding program. It also applies to some other characters in the Dune series, but ultimately we should consider its use with Paul, Leto II, and later with Duncan Idaho. In that sense we can look at them from the viewpoint of the hero as prophet, hero as divinity, and hero as mortal, each of which attains a divine or semi-divine status, religious following, mysterious death, and ultimately apotheosis. Aside from the messianic complex, the superhero therefore is simply someone whose powers and abilities go above and beyond those of a hero, who is someone already endowed with talents beyond those of normal men. It is important to understand that Frank Herbert is talking about those individuals in society 
whose talents are perceived to be beyond those of the normal masses, ultimately leading to a form of hero worship. The population who idolises such an individual and grants them access to power ultimately hands over most of their decision making processes to such a hero. This in turn allows this superhero to make mistakes on a much grander scale than any given normal individual would. Herbert's attitude, especially towards the superhero, was based on what I believe can clearly be seen as three distinct concepts. The first of these is the hero based on contemporary historical, military, political and religious figures. The second concept of the dangerous hero was exemplary in the emerging tradition of the protagonist as represented in science fiction literature of the time, in particular that of the golden age of science fiction which is generally identified as that period of science fiction that flourished under the editorial leadership of John W. Campbell. The third and final view of the hero is that of the classical and mythical heroic archetype, in particular based upon the works of Lord Raglan, Joseph Campbell and Carl Gustav Jung, and usually albeit incorrectly portrayed as a ubiquitous model based on the western heroic traditions presented in myths, legends, epics and sagas. Such ubiquitous models are apparent in works such as the concept of the monomyth by Campbell and Lord Raglan's step by step guide to the mythical hero as portrayed in drama and ritual. The germination of this perspective towards messianic heroes and superheroes can be found in Herbert's relationship with close family friends Irene Slattery and her husband Dr Ralph Slattery. In the biography of his father Dreamer of Dune, Brian Herbert discusses Frank's relationship with Irene and Ralph, which emerged out of his interest in the works of the psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung. Frank got to know the Slattery family after attending a talk in a church in Santa Rosa given by Irene herself. Frank and his wife Beverly sat next to Ralph in the audience and they became fast friends. Frank's continuing interest in Jungian psychology was spurred on by Irene Slattery, who had in fact been a student of Jung in the 1930s in Germany. During this time she had seen Adolf Hitler speak to the German people and was very frightened by what she saw and heard. Hitler terrified her from the moment she first gazed upon him. He was a skillful demagogue, she said, an expert at couching twisted, angry thoughts in words that sounded convincing. He was a hero to the German people, and terribly dangerous in that position, she felt, because of the way his people followed him slavishly, without questioning him, without thinking for themselves. Irene Slattery had related this experience to Frank Herbert years after the event, and according to Brian Herbert, this was the spark that ignited his father's interest in this theme of the disastrous superhero. This can be regarded in the context of the first of the three concepts pertaining to the hero that are presented in Dune. Her thoughts about the danger of heroes simmered in Dad's highly receptive brain and ultimately would form a cornerstone of the Dune series. Heroes are dangerous, especially when people follow them slavishly, treating them like gods. Despite this obvious example of how a so called hero whose abilities to entrance a population into blind obedience or obsequious adoration, Hitler was not the only example of a leader whose influence was catastrophic for the people that followed him, and Herbert would often cite the likes of Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt. But the two leaders he most often referred to in terms of the Camelot pattern were the examples of John F. Kennedy and General George Patton. My favourite examples are John F. Kennedy and George Patton. Both fitted themselves into the flamboyant Camelot pattern, consciously assuming bigger than life appearance. But the most casual observation reveals that neither was bigger than life. Each had our common ailment, clay feet. This then was one of my themes. Don't give over all of your critical faculties to people in power, no matter how admirable those people may appear. So the fallibility of the hero, fundamentally tied to the inherent systems of power was an ultimately destructive force for society from Frank Herbert's perspective. But the nature of the hero in itself was not enough alone to be the impetus for this disastrous impact. Heroes have followers, and it is in June that the reader becomes complicit in these messianic convulsions that have taken over the Fremen 
just as in real life the likes of Kennedy, Hitler and Patton would ultimately remain a great deal less powerful without the en masse adoring followers that they maintain. This complicity on the reader's part comes from our conscious support of the novel's protagonist who is both sympathetic and intriguing. Everything that affects Paul in June is not just part of the heroic process, but designed to garner our sympathy for the hero. His initial innocence, the tragedy of the fall of his father's house, and the grotesque villainy of the Harkonnen all serve to garner our sympathy for Paul. It is only with the inversion of themes that begin in June Messiah that we realise to our horror what this hero has done. What is even worse is the justification for his genocidal jihad that on many levels the reader can find not only understandable, but even justifiable. The second concept of the hero that June explores and at the same time undermines is that presented by the development of contemporary science fiction. Science fiction had two real traditions of the hero. The first of these traditions is what John Clute and Peter Nichols refer to in the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction as the Edisonian model, a term taken from the name of the famous inventor Thomas Edison. The Edisonian model refers to an archetypal hero who is essentially an American, male, and is either an inventor or scientist by occupation and who often uses his scientific knowledge or technical skill at invention to get him out of a particularly tight spot. As used here, the term Edisonade, derived from Thomas Alva Edison in the same way that Robinsonade is derived from Robinson Crusoe, can be understood to describe any story which features a young US male inventor hero who uses ingenuity to extricate himself from tight spots and who, by doing so, saves himself from defeat and corruption and his friends and nation from foreign oppressors. The invention by which he typically accomplishes this feat is not, however, simply a weapon, though it will almost certainly prove to be invincible against the foe and may also make the hero's fortune. It is also a means of transportation, for the Edison Aid is not only about saving the country or planet through personal spunk and native wit, it is also about lighting out for territory. The Edisonian hero as discussed above is a particular science fiction take on the concept of the Robinsonade hero taken from Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. The term was coined because of the influence Defoe's work had, creating and influencing a literary genre all of its own, often identifiable by the dislocation and separation of the protagonists from everyday life and civilization. A number of science fiction works also fall into the category of Robinsonades, including the likes of William Golding's The Lord of the Flies, Robert A. Heinlein's Tunnel in the Sky, and Tom Godwin's The Survivors, to name but a few. Thomas Edison himself was also notably such a protagonist. In Garrett P. Service's Edison's Conquest of Mars, the Edisonade hero, however, bears little resemblance in reality to the Robinsonade despite the genres crossing over now and then. This occurs really for the simple reason that science fiction is capable of blending and mixing with just about any other genre. The Edisonade's original archetype owes more to the Cretan inventor Daedalus from Greek mythology, and who can be seen as the original inventor hero. Developing out of the tradition of the Edisonade is another kind of hero, one who would later subvert the Edisonade to the status of a heroic companion or sidekick. This type of hero is more focused towards action, and is often a young athletic male who has become entangled in whatever convoluted scientific plot presents itself, and resolves the peril and calamities he is involved in by scrapping his way through his problems with fists, laser guns, or spaceships. Probably two of the most famous of these early science fiction scrappers are without doubt the likes of Philip Francis Nolan's Buck Rogers, Edisonade companion being Dr. Heer, and Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon, Edisonade companion being Dr. Hans Zarkov. Buck Rogers first appeared in Amazing Stories as the novella Armageddon 24 19 AD, before making the move to become the first science fiction serial comic strip for the National Newspaper Service Syndicate. Flash Gordon was to later appear in 1934 to compete with the already established Buck Rogers. Over the next decade or so, 
the science fiction hero began to take on more and more of the attributes of the superhero, whose popularity was growing in the comic strip world since the appearance of Superman in the first edition of Action Comics. Despite these traditions of the hero common to science fiction, there was a new kind of hero that would begin to dominate the genre from the 40s onwards. Pushing aside the traditional science fiction heroes was the emergence of the Van Vautian hero, which began with Alfred Elton Van Vaught's novel Slan. The Van Vautian hero, Johnny Cross in Slan, was essentially an evolved ubermensch. This was a much more solitary type of hero, often alienated and isolated from society, race or nation, and bearing the attributes of a particular evolutionary advantage, or else some kind of super or psionic power. The Van Vautian hero owed a great deal to the development of superheroes, as well as some of the emerging and developing philosophies, such as Korzybski's General Semantics and L. Ron Hubbard's Dianetics. It can also be said that this kind of hero was exactly the kind of hero that John W. Campbell wanted as a protagonist in the stories he sought to publish at the time. Van Vaught used Korzybski's General Semantics in some of his more famous works, such as the Null A novels and was also a notable follower of Hubbard's Dianetics, though not so much with the subsequent Church of Scientology. It is not a far stretch of the imagination to see how ultimately this development in science fiction would soon take another leap along these lines towards messianic characters, and it was exactly this that Herbert sought to challenge with Dune. The deep irony of Dune's popular triumph and that of its many sequels is Herbert's declared intention to undermine exactly that besotted identification with Van Vautian's Superman hero. It is in this crux, as much as in the stylistic advances and excesses of the new wave, that the 60s made its mark on science fiction, and science fiction made its greater mark on the world. The third concept of the nature of the hero that especially interested Herbert was that of the classical archetype as had been discussed by the likes of Lord Raglan, Joseph Campbell and Carl Jung. Not only through the archetypes of the hero in myth, but especially the 22 steps that the hero follows according to Lord Raglan, and the concept of the monomyth developed by Campbell, form very much the framework of the trials and tribulations of Paul Atreides in June. Much of Lord Raglan's work in The Hero, a study in tradition, myth and drama, examines the roles of both myths and heroes in an ahistorical context. This approach is deeply flawed and egocentric, and presents the view that there is often little or no basis for evidence that the mythical hero existed historically, but rather has some basis in ritual and drama. There are no valid grounds for believing in the historicity of tradition or really heroes of myth, and that of a saga, far from being a record of fact, is really a novel based chiefly on myth. In essence, Lord Raglan is saying that the hero is formed out of generally archaic traditions. His argument that there is no justification for believing that any of these heroes were real persons is quite ludicrous and sadly cannot even be argued to be a product of its times. At least ten of the characters that Raglan discusses can be seen to have some historical basis, although it is true that not all of the characters he discusses can be considered either historical or real. That is not to say that the process of ritual around the hero is invalid, as this often occurs when a heroic figure is enshrined in worship as part of a religion or cult, or indeed rendered into the larger awareness through myth. What did represent an interest to Frank Herbert was the way Lord Raglan presented a pattern for the hero's life, 22 ritualistic steps from birth to death which the majority of heroes proceed through during the lifespan of their myth. Brian Herbert refers to his father's study of Lord Raglan's book in Dreamer of Dune, and in particular Raglan's idea of the ritual pattern. Raglan did believe it would be easy to add additional steps to his pattern. The 22 steps which Raglan created for his blueprint in The Hero are as follows. 1. The hero's mother is a royal virgin. 2. His father is a king. And 3. Often a near relative of his mother, but 4. The circumstances of his conception are unusual. And 5. He is also reputed to be a son of a god. 6. 
At birth, an attempt is made, usually by his father or his maternal grandfather, to kill him. But, seven, he is spirited away, and, eight, reared by foster parents in a far country. Nine, we are told nothing of his childhood, but, ten, on reaching manhood, he returns or goes to see his future kingdom. Eleven, after a victory over the king and or a giant stroke dragon or wild beast, twelve, he marries a princess, often the daughter of his predecessor, and thirteen, becomes king. Fourteen, for a time he reigns uneventfully, and fifteen, prescribes laws, but sixteen, later he loses favour with the gods and or his subjects, and seventeen, is driven from his throne and city, after which Eighteen, he meets with a mysterious death. Nineteen, often at the top of a hill. Twenty, his children, if any, do not succeed him. Twenty-one, his body is not buried, but nevertheless, twenty-two, he has one or more holy sepulchres. The character of Paul Atreides follows many of these steps throughout the first great Dune trilogy, and to a certain extent, so does his son Leto II. In Dune, Paul moves through this ritual pattern until the point of becoming king, or emperor, which is the thirteenth step on Raglan's list. 1. Not attributed. His mother is actually a Bene Gesserit concubine. 2. His father, Leto, is a duke. 3. His father is a near relative to his mother. Jessica, Duke Leto's concubine, is the daughter of his father's enemy, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. 4. The circumstances of his conception are unusual. His mother, Jessica, is ordered to give birth to a female child. She disobeys out of her love for Leto and conceives a male child instead. He is, however, a product of a breeding program which has been manipulating bloodlines for thousands of years in the hope of creating a super being, a Kwisatz Sadarach, which is essentially a male version of a Bene Gesserit. 5. He is considered to be a messiah the Mahdi or Lisan al-Gib by the Fremen, and a potential Kwisatz Sadarak by the Bene Gesserit. 6. An attempt is made to kill him by his maternal grandfather, though in his youth rather than at birth. This occurs when he arrives on Arrakis, which can be seen as his symbolic rebirth. 7. He is spirited away both to Arrakis and later into the desert to escape the Harkonnen. 8 where he is looked after and educated by the Fremen in the ways of the desert. 9. We know little of his childhood. Paul is 15 when we first meet him. 10. On reaching manhood, he goes to his future kingdom, the planet Arrakis. 11. He conquers the worms, Shai Halud and Shaitan of Arrakis, comparable to slaying a dragon or attaining the pearl of great wisdom. 12. He marries a princess, Irulan who is the daughter of his predecessor, the Emperor Shaddam IV. Irulan is a wife in name only. Paul takes for his concubine the woman he loves, Chani, the daughter of Liet Kynes, who is also, in a sense, his predecessor. 13. He becomes emperor of the known universe and the leader of his own all-encompassing religion. Paul continues in the tradition of Raglan's ritual steps in the second and third parts of the first trilogy, June Messiah, and Children of Dune. Again, Paul fulfills most of the latter stages with the exceptions of steps 19 and 20. That is, he does not die atop a hill, and his child Leto II does succeed him both in undertaking the Golden Path and becoming Emperor. In that sense, Paul Atreides fulfills 19 of the 22 steps described in Lord Raglan's pattern, matching the scores of both King Arthur and Dionysus. Only three so-called mythical figures presented by Raglan score more, with Moses and Theseus both scoring 20, and Oedipus alone scores 22. In his conclusion to the use of his heroic scale, Raglan firm in his belief that these heroic figures have no basis in reality or history, states that the historical figure applied to this scale seldom scores more than 6 or 7 points. The conclusion that suggests itself is that the god is the hero as he appears in ritual, and the hero is the god as he appears in myth. In other words, 
The hero and the god are two different aspects of the same superhuman being. It is not my intent to debate Raglan's attitude towards the heroic ideal in myth or the fact that he fundamentally fails to realise that the hero quite often appears in source material other than novels, epics and sagas. His work has been the subject of much heated discussion over the years since the hero was written, but regardless of this fact, the point here is to show his influence on Frank Herbert, and in particular the steps that he sends his very non-archetypal hero, Paul Atreides, through. Raglan's words above are very much mirrored by Frank Herbert in Dune Messiah and illustrate very nicely the influence Raglan's book had upon him. There exists no separation between gods and men. One blends softly casual into the other. Proverbs of Moadib. Carl Gustav Jung's influence on Frank Herbert is apparent from the beginnings of his career as a writer, and his interests in psychology and psychoanalysis dominate the themes of his first novel, The Dragon in the Sea. This interest in these subjects, as mentioned earlier, was greatly influenced by Frank's relationship with the Slattery family, and in Brian Herbert's biography of his father Dreamer of Dune, he discusses the importance of this to Frank. In particular it helped Frank to understand how important it was to his writings to develop a realistic understanding of human motivation, which would then provide him with the essential component of characterization. In fact the dominant themes of psychology entwined with ecology are in many ways taken from the dragon in the sea and expanded upon greatly in Dune. The influence of Jung was so great on Herbert, it also featured heavily in most of his story's themes, and in his characterization. In Dune it forms a fundamental element of his study of dangerous superheroes. In initially constructing the language and style of Dune, he often used the motifs of the Jungian mandala in developing his writing. Much of the prose in Dune started out as haiku and then was given minimal additional word padding to make it conform to normal English structure. I often use a Jungian mandala in squaring off characters of a yarn against each other, assigning a dominant psychological role to each. The implications of colour, position, word root and prosodic suggestion are all taken into account when a scene has to have maximum impact, and what scene doesn't if a book is tightly written? In addition to predominantly influencing not only his writing style, the study of Jung's ideas of the archetypes and the collective unconscious also featured heavily in Herbert's understanding of the hero and myth. According to Jung, the unconscious is a gathering place of forgotten and repressed contents, but differentiates between an individual or personal unconscious and what he calls a collective unconscious. The experiences acquired within the personal unconscious are unique, and specific to any given individual, generally seen as complexes, and Jung sees the personal unconscious as a superficial layer which rests upon a deeper layer, called the collective unconscious. Jung used this term as he saw the collective unconscious as a shared set of ubiquitous psychic content. These collective contents that share a commonality of form and idea are what Jung described as the archetypes of the collective unconscious. The heroic ideal then is an archetype to all cultures as for example are the archetypal figures of the father and mother figures, the child, the core, the trickster and the syzygy, along with numerous others. Jung discusses in some detail the psychological aspects of the core in relation to the archetype. In its mythological context, the Kore is a representation of the Greek Chthonic deity Persephone as the maiden in relationship to her mother, the Olympian goddess Demeter, and the Chthonic deity Hecate, who is the crone. Collectively they represent a triple goddess which is predominant in many early religions and mythologies. This is common to the representation of these goddesses as deities of the earth, in particular of grain and harvest. Persephone as the youngest form of the triple goddess would represent the young corn, and hence her association for a part of the year with the underworld. Demeter as the mother represents the ripening corn, and Hecate as the old mother or crone 
would represent the harvested crop and therefore death and renewal. In this sense, the archetype of the Kore and the Triple Goddess can be seen as representations of farming and harvest, and hence the rituals that develop around these seasonal activities for human beings in early primitive cultures. Such early mythological patterns represent how these cultures develop an understanding of the natural world and its cycles and patterns. Within Dune we can see representations of the Triple Goddess in more ways than one. As is revealed in the Dune prequels, the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam is Jessica's mother, and hence Paul's grandmother. Mohiam represents the crone of this archetype, whereas Jessica appears as the mother. It is with Alia, her preborn daughter, that we have another representation of an archetype within an archetype, echoing always the spiral or chaotic nature of that which is hidden within pre existing forms, such as the Machiavellian plans within plans within plans, and the eyes of those addicted to the spice melange, which are blue within blue within blue. Alia is at once the youth, the daughter, and innocent virgin. In the case of the Triple Goddess, she represents the Kore, but as she is described in Dune Messiah, she is also individually the Virgin and Harlot, yet another archetype. Herbert, who obviously ascribes these archetypes to Alia, describes her as follows in one of the novel's historical passages which begin each chapter. The Fremen see her as the Earth figure, a demigoddess whose special charge is to protect the tribes through her powers of violence. She is reverend mother to their reverend mothers, to pilgrims who seek her out with demands that she restore virility or make the barren fruitful, she is a form of anti-mentat. She feeds on that proof that the analytic has limits. She represents ultimate tension. She is the virgin harlot, witty, vulgar, cruel as destructive in her whims as a Coriolis storm. St Alia of the Knife, as taken from the Irulan report. Alia in addition to this represents one half of the syzygy with Paul, together being two parts of the male-female counterpart Janus deity. While both have other memory, Paul the male and female line, and Alia the female Bene Gesserit line, Paul is able to look forward to the possible futures with his prescient sight, while Alia is severely limited in this ability. Leto II and Ganema also represent another form of the Syzygy archetype, the two preborn Atreides twins, sharing much in common with their father Paul and their aunt Alia. Within these Jungian archetypes, both Leto I and Liet kinds function as the father, both actual and adoptive while Jessica functions as the mother archetype, partly transitioning through the different stages of the triple goddess form. Numerous characters also function within the hero archetype, both male and female, over the course of the Dune series, notable that Paul Atreides is a superhero amongst many heroes. The Baron Vladimir Harkonnen is an archetypal villain and trickster at the same time and also forms part of a syzygy with Alia through her uncontrolled use of other memory, which ultimately leads to her becoming an abomination. Brian Herbert also discusses his father's interest in Jungian archetypes in the first Dune novel. Other mythological archetypes were found in Dune as well, including a fool, Raban, a witch mother, the reverend mother Gaius Helen Mohiam, a virgin witch, Alia, and the wise old man of Dune mythology, Pardot Kynes. Jungian archetypes perpetuate throughout the Dune series, and whether they possess any validity in the study of mythology, as mythemes perhaps, again what is important to note here is Herbert's deliberate use of them. Jungian archetypes are prevalent in the Dune series, used by Herbert both in developing his characters and creating and fleshing out his concept of the dangerous superhero. Lord Raglan's work presented the mythical hero in a very much ahistorical context, and did not deem it necessary to examine the myth in other ways except as part of ritual and drama. Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces presents a much more convincing examination of the nature of myth 
albeit again through a flawed approach which is mainly via a social and psychological point of view. In respect to Frank Herbert, and especially his keen interest in psychology, it is likely to suggest that Campbell's work had much more appeal to him as an author and avid researcher, though to go from Raglan to Young to Campbell in this type of study of the hero is a logical progression. It is also worth mentioning that a resurgence of interest in Campbell's work had materialised through the cinematic event that became the Star Wars phenomenon. George Lucas's Star Wars franchise was considered to be a work that borrowed heavily from Frank Herbert's Dune, amongst other science fiction books, as well as movies such as Akira Kurosawa's Hidden Fortress. What is of particular interest is that Lucas often cited the same original source of inspiration for constructing his space opera monomyth, namely that of Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. When Dad saw the movie, Star Wars, he picked out 16 points of what he called absolute identity between his book and the movie, enough to make him livid. He thought he saw the ideas of other science fiction writers on the screen as well, including those of Isaac Asimov, Larry Niven, Ted Sturgeon, Barry Malzberg, and Jerry Pornell. Still, Frank Herbert tried to be upbeat. He and other science fiction writers who thought they saw their work in Lucas's movie formed a loose organisation that my father called, with his tongue firmly placed in his cheek, the We're Too Big to Sue George Lucas Society. Through humour, Dad tried to mask the pain. Perhaps the fact that both Lucas and Herbert were trying to embed universal myths within their work, in order to create a ubiquitous set of themes and characters that certainly in the case of Star Wars, would appeal to a mass audience, meant that the reasons for this absolute identity were lost on Frank Herbert. If indeed both works are composed around creating universal myths which follow a certain pattern, there is little doubt to expect a wide number of similarities. As such, if myths contain universal elements, I prefer to consider comparative mythology or mythemes rather than a concept of a monomyth, then similarities between Dune and Star Wars are no different than for example the many similarities between Beowulf and the Epic of Gilgamesh, even though many centuries separate the works. What is clear is that both Lucas and Herbert had been enthralled by Campbell's work on the monomyth, in discussing the concept of the monomyth, Joseph Campbell describes the role of mythology as follows. It has always been the prime function of mythology and right to supply the symbols that carry the human spirit forward, in counteraction to those other constant human fantasies that tend to tie it back. Campbell's concept of the monomyth, like Lord Raglan's, sees the hero's adventure take him through a number of universal stages in his quest, in this case, 17 in total. These 17 key areas fall into three main categories, which are as follows. Stage 1 is the departure and features five steps. The call to adventure, refusal of the call, supernatural aid, the crossing of the first threshold, and the belly of the whale. Stage 2 is the initiation, and features six parts. The road of trials, the meeting with the goddess, Woman as Temptress, Atonement with the Father, Apotheosis, and the Ultimate Boon. Stage 3 is the Return and has six steps. The Refusal of the Return, the Magic Flight, Rescue from Without, the Crossing of the Return Threshold, Master of the Two Worlds, and Freedom to Live. What is fundamental to the concept of the monomyth is that all forms of mythology, whatever their social, religious, cultural or chronological context in which they have evolved, share a common ancestry to the human psyche. The question that Campbell asks is, why is mythology everywhere the same, beneath its varieties of costume, and what does it teach? Campbell's ideas are inextricably linked to the fields of psychology and psychoanalysis, in particular the works of those such as Freud, but it is especially the influence of Carl Gustav Jung, that can be found within his work. The ancient myths as he sees it are alive today and influencing us in our daily lives through our subconscious, carried forward by a form of race memory or collective unconsciousness. 
This idea is in much the same manner as Jung's notions of the collective unconscious as the ideas put forward about evolution by Samuel Butler, discussed in the previous chapter. The concept of the monomyth was taken by Campbell from James Joyce's novel Finnegan's Wake. The normal route that the hero takes according to Campbell was that which derived from the rites of passage, separation, initiation, return, which might be named the nuclear unit of the monomyth. The rite of passage sees the hero set forth on his journey where he overcomes certain tasks or obstacles in a world that is usually to some degree supernatural, before returning to the world he left with new powers which he is able to use to help his fellow man. Whether this is in a mythological context, which Campbell sees as a representation of the macrocosmical triumph of the hero, or in fairy tales, which tend to be more microcosmical in their achievements, the monomyth has a pervasive universality to all cultures of humanity, which is fundamental to our hopes, fears, history, and sense of future. The two, the hero and his ultimate god, that seeker and the found, are thus understood as the outside and inside of a single, self-mirrored mystery, which is identical with the mystery of the manifest world. The great deed of the supreme hero is to come to the knowledge of this unity in multiplicity and then to make it known. Raglan, Young and Campbell's work are however representative of what Robert Graves called the process of iconotropy, which is where the myth has been either deliberately or accidentally misinterpreted. The correct approach to myth is much as Graves states, relying on archaeological evidence as a reliable guide to understanding, and if this is not available, then the historical and anthropological approach would seem best. Ultimately these endeavours at mythography fail to attempt such an approach, and simply contain wild speculations backed up by bizarre theories, which stem more from these individuals' own beliefs, rather than any proper attempt to understand the archaic traditions, cultures and civilizations that spawned such heroes and myths. In looking at the myths and legends that span the globe throughout the ages, we can see a wide variance of ideas, rites, traditions and religions, many of which are unique and lend themselves to distinct cultural flavours of their specific regions. In fact, the works of these men are fundamentally orientated, with few exceptions, to the myths and legends of the Western world, without undertaking a detailed approach to the idiosyncratic nature of more distant and ancient cultures. Herbert in his own way does make an attempt to successfully blend various ideas of religion, culture and myth in Dune, and although there is much in the nature of western myth and legend within the work, we also see successful representations of a number of historical, linguistic, mythological, cultural and religious tropes within the Dune series. Basing his concept of the hero on the works of Lord Raglan, Young and Campbell, Frank Herbert's attitude towards the hero is twofold, and to a certain extent almost schizophrenic. To Herbert, the hero and the superhero that successfully follows the flamboyant Camelot pattern is a fundamentally dangerous entity for the society that follows him. This hero can be religious, militaristic or political in their outlook and background, and it is when the masses begin to follow larger than life heroes such as these that there exists the potential for a great deal of damage to be inflicted upon society. Simultaneously, Herbert is also using the concept of the monomythical hero and his mythological quest to provide a universally recognisable framework for his story in Dune. Even though the first part of Dune sets up the structure presented in Raglan's ritualistic steps and Campbell's monomyth, that of separation, initiation and return of the hero, he will then have his hero become utterly destructive to the societies of the Empire, and most especially to those who follow him blindly, his own adoptive people, the Fremen. The hero can be bad for society, of this there in a sense can be little doubt, though it is certainly not always the case. Herbert preferred to look at the bigger picture in life, especially in his ideas of ecology, and in this case, it seemed he was unable to look to the end of his hero's actions. If Hitler was a so-called hero to Nazi Germany, 
His actions were destructive not only to his enemies, but especially to his own people. Hence, in this aspect, Herbert's attitude to the hero is proven correct. But against this, if we look at Campbell's view that the actions of Hitler as a hero bring about the death and destruction of a certain culture or society, then this represents the symbolic deficiency that exists in the world of the hero. The death process is ultimately part of the common symbolism of the monomyth, and is required for rebirth. In other words, sometimes these dangerous heroes, who are destructive for society, ultimately benefit mankind in the long run by bringing about a process of renewal after the destruction they cause. The composite hero of the monomyth is a personage of exceptional gifts. Frequently, he is honoured by this society, frequently unrecognised or disdained. He and or the world in which he finds himself suffers from a symbolic deficiency. In fairy tales this might be as slight as the lack of a certain golden ring, whereas in apocalyptic vision the physical and spiritual life of the whole earth can be represented as fallen or on the point of falling into ruin. Donald E. Palumbo, in his examination of chaos theory within Frank Herbert's Dune, sees the monomyth as echoing and bolstering the chaotic fractal patterns that appear in an ecological context in Dune. He examines this in two chapters which are an interesting take on the idea of the monomyth within the Dune series. There are indeed possibilities here, as there can be seen an identity with Campbell's visual representation of the monomyth with Jungian mandalas and even Herbert's map of Arrakis. Palumbo argues that the monomyth itself is intrinsically and thoroughly fractal, and as both it and its component elements recur in each novel in the series, demonstrates the series fractal self-similarity across the same scale, volume after volume. Ultimately in presenting us with a future mythology in Dune, and showing us his own version of a far-flung monomyth, Herbert is asking us some deep-seated questions. The concept of the hero being bad for society allows Herbert in presenting this key theme in Dune to hide within the text another major theme, that of ecology, which I will examine in the following chapter. At the same time, having studied the nature of myths from the likes of Campbell and Raglan, he is successfully able to create a blend of cultures, religions, philosophies and languages in Dune, which lend a sense of verisimilitude to his universe not often found in science fiction. In taking science fiction as a genre and by successfully presenting it in a more didactic and literary form, in combination with his own concepts, Herbert is able to, like Campbell, ask us quite simply and without imposing his own ideas upon us, a simple question. What does this teach us?